Hey there. Welcome back to another season of Novel Conversations. Before we start the show, I wanted to recommend another great podcast about books. It's the Professional Book Nerds Podcast. If you enjoy listening to Novel Conversations, I think you'll really enjoy this podcast as well. The Professional Book Nerds Podcast offers up book recommendations and interviews your favorite authors every Monday and Thursday. Both Jill Grunenwald and Adam Sokol have spent their careers in the book world and have an inside look on exciting books you're going to love. In addition to their twice-a-week episodes, each month they preview the best new books coming out. They're not just book nerds, they're professional book nerds. Visit professionalbooknerds.com, subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts, or check them out on our own network, evergreenpodcast.com. All right, up next, Novel Conversations. I'm Frank Lavallo, and this is Novel Conversations, a podcast about the world's greatest stories. Each week on Novel Conversations, I talk to two guests about one book, and together we summarize the story for you. We introduce you to the characters, we tell you what happens to them, and we read from the book along the way. So if you love hearing a good story, you're in the right place. This week's conversation is about the novel Mrs. Dalloway by Virginia Woolf, and I'm joined in our conversation today by our Novel Conversations readers, Katie Smith and Peter Toomey. Hi, Frank. Hey, Frank. Nice to be here. All right, so let's set up the story of our novel. Mrs. Dalloway by Virginia Woolf was published in 1925. It's set in London right after World War I, and it's the story of one day, one long day, in the life of Clarissa Dalloway, the socialite wife of a local politician, Richard Dalloway, and the mother of Elizabeth. How Mrs. Dalloway gets through her long day while interacting with family, servants, and several long-lost friends, all the while maintaining an almost constant interior dialogue, make up most of our novel. And before we begin our discussion, I just want to make a quick note that this book is one of the best of Virginia Woolf's, but it's also one of the most challenging books to read. There's over a hundred minor characters in this novel, certainly only a few major ones, but Virginia Woolf does introduce us to a lot of people, sometimes with one or two quick lines and then they're gone. Katie, did you have a hard time reading this book? Oh, I loved the book. Despite the challenges, it's a panorama of London during a specific time. The number of characters in the book give a full view of life in London at the time. And Peter, what about you? Were you up to the challenge? Yes, I was. I particularly love the time period, World War I, with the whole Bloomsbury era. Do you want to give me a, just a quick description of the Bloomsbury group? Well, the Bloomsbury group defined themselves in friendships, a core of Cambridge students and the two Stephan sisters, Virginia and her sister Vanessa. Now, they were artists and writers, and they lived in London. I was fascinated with them. During this horrible time of history, World War I, the influenza epidemic, and the stress between the two wars, they had the ability to isolate themselves from the culture and still be so creative. Perhaps as a result of that, the ability to be creative runs into Mrs. Dalloway, too. What fascinates me is Mrs. Dalloway's creativity, which arose from her ability to isolate herself. Peter, perhaps we should mention where the Bloomsbury group gets their name? When Leslie Steffen, the father of the two girls, died, they were a very Victorian state family. The two daughters moved with their brothers to a place in the Bloomsbury district of London, which was a Bohemian district. This was quite a chancy thing for them to do, and their families, of course, were outraged. So that's where they got the name. They began to create almost a salon feel there, but of a bohemian nature. Peter, do you have any other writers that may have been in this group? Do you have a name or two for us? Well, to name a few, there was Lytton Strachey. Right, who wrote Imminent Victorians. There were artists, uh, Duncan Grant, a uh, writer, uh, Clive Bell, Roger Fry, who were art critics, uh, T.S. Eliot, uh, Ian Forster, uh, John Maynard Keynes. Right, The Economist. All right, with those introductions, I want to talk about the title character of our novel, Mrs. Dalloway, and of course, some of her other friends. All right, Katie, let me start with you. Mrs. Dalloway, she's a 50-ish woman. 52. 52, living in London. She's been sickly. She had influenza, I believe. And now she's coming out of that sickness, and she's planning to throw a party. In this novel, Mrs. Dalloway, the story really is about her entire day, from the time she wakes up to the time the party that she's planned all day ends. What were your first impressions of Clarissa Dalloway or Mrs. Dalloway? I was surprised this time on reading it to realize she was 52. 
Uh, did you have an age in mind when you first read about her? Forty. And in fact, that's the age that Virginia was when she wrote the book. Clarissa Dalloway is, for me, the epitome of what a hostess should be, which I'm always trying to live up to and never am. But underneath is this whole woman who's there or not there and reaching out for what she should be and what she wants to be and maybe pushing herself away from who she is. Right. You know, we should say that throughout this entire novel, we're really getting two conversations. We get Mrs. Dalloway and, of course, her friends and their conversations with each other. But then all of the main characters will have an ongoing, continuous conversation with themselves in a sort of stream of consciousness interior dialogue where they're commenting on what they're seeing, commenting on what they're hearing. Sometimes, Peter, it's a little bit hard to follow and just figure out who's talking and whether they're talking out loud or if they're thinking. Exactly. The paragraph of Virginia Woolf's in this book is not separated by punctuation marks in the way that one would find in other fiction. There are many different characters thinking many different thoughts, perhaps in the same paragraph. It really requires your attention. It's not a book that I found pleasing to read while I'm in bed. You can't be lying down when you're reading this book. I found it just plain difficult to follow. Because there's this sort of switching back and forth between interior dialogue and actual conversation. It affects the way you think and feel about Clarissa Dalloway. Well, I think it's part of the fabric of the book. Once one picks up the style of the prose, you know, the, almost the rhythm of it, then you become more comfortable with it. The form of the book for me is easier to accept and to read if I'm not expecting that it's going to be just a surface plot kind of book. In her diaries, Virginia Woolf talked about that she wanted to create people who, like all of us, have these tunnels of memory and experience behind us that people either see or don't see, but we know they're there. You have her drifting from one tunnel of experience and memory into somebody else's, and they're connected in really interesting ways like how people view the clouds differently or how they hear the sounds of Big Ben differently. It's very poetic. And we get that almost from the very beginning of the novel. Very beginning. I think within the first two paragraphs, she wakes up, she's leaving her house to do some shopping for flowers for her party that's coming that night. And within that second paragraph, she's already flashing back to a memory of her childhood home and a childhood friend. She goes out the door of her London home and she bursts into the gardens of Burton. I just think that's the marvelous way to think of the book. We're all looking out of a box, and behind the box, there's all this information going on that no one else can see, but that is very real. And one of the first memories that she has as she's walking down the street is she immediately thinks of an old friend, Peter Walsh. Peter, do you want to tell me who Peter Walsh was to Clarissa? Well, Peter Walsh represented to Clarissa a certain attitude towards life. Peter Walsh, as I read him, was full of unrequited love for Clarissa, but he was also a dreamer and a cynic, one who spent a lot of time in his head, worrying and scheming and dreaming about things. That Clarissa settled for Dalloway, who was a doer rather than a dreamer, said something about uh, Clarissa's choices in her life. Peter Walsh and Richard Dalloway were both suitors for Clarissa? That's correct. And at one point, Peter considered himself engaged to Clarissa, and then Clarissa ended up with Richard Dalloway. Peter made tremendous demands upon Clarissa to believe or not believe, to do or not to do. Peter had expectations of people that Dalloway did not have. Clarissa made her choice between two extremes. Katie, did you see Peter Walsh as the dreamer and Richard Dalloway as the doer? I think Peter Walsh represents more than just the suitor, but alter ego for Clarissa. She said at one point in so many words, if I had married Peter, I could have had this gaiety always, but it would have forced her to be totally involved and taken away that center self of her. And Richard didn't require any of this of her. She just had to be there and to do the things that women did. As you mentioned before, she was a hostess, a perfect hostess. Yes, right. This perfect hostess. And that was all he required in order to love her. And Peter would never have accepted that. In fact, doesn't Peter Walsh use hostess almost as an insult? Yes, he does. Against Clarissa. Yes, that's correct. As I recall this scene, Clarissa reminded herself that she could have had all Peter had to offer. It was after he had cried again, and she said, To think that I could have lived like this through all my life. 
He was a guy who wore his heart on his sleeve and had tremendous expectations of other people. Peter, you said cried again. There were at least three or four scenes throughout the book where he was immediately brought to tears by one emotion or another. Yes. I'm not sure, though, I totally agree with you, Katie, that Clarissa was the opposite of Peter. To me, they were both sort of dreamers and not doers. And they might have had a gay life together, but it would not have been an accomplished life. I agree. They weren't opposites. To be with Peter, she would have had to give up all of the other and be totally involved. Well, she talked about passion and religion being dangerous. She would have had to be a totally patient person and would have robbed her of some sense of self and distance that she needs to be herself. She would have had to become Peter almost. You know, did some of that interior dialogue seem almost as if they were whining a bit, a bit of, these are all my woes and my troubles? On Peter's part? Yeah, on Peter, even on Clarissa Dalloway a little bit. Uh, I felt that much more with Peter. The constant introspection, the constant reviewing, the constant reminding himself of the loss, you know, so much more than Clarissa. Clarissa, for me, seemed resolute in her need for privacy and her need for space. She came across to me as a woman who made her choice and knew what she wanted, and she followed through with it. You know, Peter, let me stop you right here. We've actually started talking about Peter Walsh and haven't actually really explained how he came back into Clarissa's life. As we said, Peter was a former suitor. Clarissa chose Richard Dalloway over Peter Walsh, and Peter goes to India. He has a failed marriage and happens to come back to London on the same day that Clarissa's having her big party. We meet Peter when he comes to pay a visit on Clarissa. I understand you have a nice little scene there that you want to read for us. Yes, uh, Clarissa is sewing a dress. She heard a hand upon the door. She made to hide her dress like a virgin protecting her chastity, respecting privacy. Now, the brass knob slipped. Now the door opened, and in came, for a single second she could not remember what he was called. So surprised she was to see him, so glad, so shy, so utterly taken aback to have Peter Walsh come to her unexpectedly in the morning. She had not read his letter. And how are you? said Peter Walsh, positively trembling, taking both her hands, kissing both her hands. She's growing older, he thought, sitting down. I shan't tell her anything about it, he thought, for she's grown older. She's looking at me, he thought. A sudden embarrassment coming over him, though he had kissed her hands. Putting his hand into his pocket, he took out a large pocket knife and half opened the blade. But Peter, his excitement at seeing Clarissa doesn't really last for very long. Within a few more paragraphs, he starts to criticize her. Yes, we have these two people looking at each other after having not seen each other for a long time, and they're both carrying on internal dialogues. Clarissa is hearing criticism. Peter is awkwardly fumbling with his knife, trying to understand exactly what it is he's feeling, yet not really understanding. But he does try to give us a little bit of his thoughts, right? Let me just read a couple of lines here. Here she was, mending her dress. Mending her dress as usual, he thought. Here she's been sitting all the time I've been in India, mending her dress, playing about, going to parties, running to the house, back and forth and all that. Katie, what's going on with this knife? And Clarissa's armed herself with scissors. I knew something was happening there, but I'm not sure what it was. You know, I knew you were going to ask me that. I've never been able to figure out exactly what the knife is about, except that it gives Peter something to do so that he isn't always talking. It's a mannerism that he's had since childhood. Right. We learn about the knife within the first page when Clarissa's walking down that street buying flowers and she's thinking of Peter. She thinks of his knife. And the knife must come out at least three or four or five times even throughout this entire story. I have this sense that it's very important and I have no idea what the metaphor is. But you agree. They both seem to be armed. He's got a knife. She's got scissors. Her needle is sharp. His knife is sharp. They're both there. I don't know. Maybe they're at pins and needles. <laughs> you know, we'll have to keep looking to find that one out. Let's move on. Now, we've talked a little bit about Clarissa. We've talked a little bit about Peter and Richard. There's one more character I'd like to talk about, and that's Septimus Warren Smith. He's introduced to us as a veteran of World War I. He's having some difficulties, what they would call shell shock. Now, of course, we call it post-traumatic stress disorder. Katie, tell me a little bit about Septimus Warren Smith. Septimus saw his best friend and cohort, Evans, shot in front of him and was able to withstand any feeling, as, of course, men were supposed to do in those days. And now he's having flashbacks and voices and the whole thing. 
It's important to remember that Virginia Woolf had periods of madness during her life. She, through the character of Septimus, is able to show us what it was like. But he played a very important part because in the original story of Mrs. Dalloway, which is a short story, Mrs. Dalloway was going to kill herself, and it's sort of an affirmation of life that Clarissa in this book lives through and endures, and she's actually a buoyant character and offers hope to us. And Septimus does kill himself. But even Septimus doesn't kill himself because he wants to be dead. He kills himself to escape human behavior, he calls it. If you fall down, he says, human behavior will be upon you. But she uses the character very well to show us how people deal with loss. He's the other part of the day. Part of the day is the party, part of the day is the suicide, and the weaving back and forth between those two things are happening. But I do want to be clear here. There's no real connection between the Clarissa Dalloway story and the Septimus Warren Smith story within our novel. The connection really is a doctor that shows up at the party and he's treated Warren Smith. But they're really separate stories. Peter, did you have a take on Septimus? For me, not only did Virginia Woolf want to write about her bouts of mental illness and use the character of Septimus in order to show what that depression was like, what that mental illness was like. I I think she also used the Septimus to show us what the treatment of the mentally ill is. Oh, definitely. And what that was like during that time. Peter, I'm going to stop you right here, and we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get back. But right now, I'd like to talk about our sponsor for this season of Novel Conversations, Literati, the leading kids' book club in America. You know, with schools and libraries and bookstores shut down right now, how are you going to keep your kids learning and growing? Well, I suggest Books from Literati. The number one book club for kids is the best place to start. Literati is a subscription book club that makes it easy to find unique and interesting books for your kids, and they deliver them right to your doorstep. Literati knows that home deliveries will be critical in meeting your need for uplifting educational materials in the coming weeks and months. And reading books together will help create a time of adventure and bonding for your family. And it has real educational benefits. We all know that kids who read books have better vocabularies and longer attention spans. And I'd like our listeners to know that these are not used books or old titles. I've received a box of books from Literati and these are new books and current titles. And the books are not just fiction or or not just nonfiction. Each box has novels, has books about science, and the box I received even had a book of puzzles. And with so many kids out of school, Literati is working to get books into the hands of families who don't have libraries or educational materials of their own. So fans of Novel Conversations, right now Literati is giving you a special limited time offer. For a limited time, go to literati.com slash novel and you'll get 25% off your first two orders. This is their best offer available anywhere. Let me repeat that. All you have to do is go to literati.com slash novel and you'll get 25% off your first two orders. Once again, literati.com slash novel. All right, back to our discussion about the novel Mrs. Dalloway by Virginia Woolf. Coming up on 5-Minute News, I'm Anthony Davis. You might think it's partisan because maybe it's critical of one side or the other, but it's not, it's just the truth. And I think that's also something that's kind of unusual for Americans listening to the radio or to podcasts because the news landscape in the States has been so partisan for so many decades. So 5-Minute News is verified, truthful, independent, unbiased and essential world news daily. So, Katie, Virginia Woolf, as you said, suffered from bouts of mental illness. I believe she uses Septimus to tell us a little bit about not only the effects of mental illness and depression on a person, but about the psychiatric establishment itself in London, how psychiatrists and doctors treated some of the mentally ill. Yes, there's a Dr. William Bradshaw. And then there's Dr. Holmes, who's kind of his go-to doctor. Bradshaw, she especially is very satirical about. His phrase is always that, You must maintain divine proportion. You hear a similar thing now about how people tell you you have to have your priorities straight. Divine proportion. She uses this in a very pretentious way. And what does Dr. Bradshaw prescribe? It's always sleep and rest. Withdraw. Withdraw, right. Withdraw from society? Right. And of course, he's hearing voices which are not going to help him withdraw anyway and not giving him a proportion, let me say. 
Peter, Virginia Woolf really has nothing good to say about the treatment of mental illness in 1920s England, does she? Well, seeing proportion as a true goal of mental health and seeing Septimus as a victim of World War I, I wonder what kind of proportion there was in the country's response to the shooting of an archduke in which hundreds of thousands of young men spent their youth in bunkers and in holes of the ground, killing each other, out of all proportion to what happened and what was to be gained by it. For me, it's sort of a satire on World War I that the word proportion is being used by Sir William to describe what is exactly needed for Septimus, who was, in a sense, a victim of something that happened way out of proportion. Uh, That's what struck me. Septimus had a great deal of proportion, though. His voices were giving him much insight into life, And of course, the voices were what Bradshaw wanted to stop. Septimus's main complaint was that he couldn't feel, but he understood. He realized that he could no longer feel, and he was aware that he was having problems. And he kept having his wife, Rizia, write down what he was thinking. And it was very poetic, and it was about the meaning of life, and it was all these philosophical insights. This was not in proportion at all with what should be happening in life. You know, I found that passage where Dr. Bradshaw talks about proportion. Let me just read a few lines. Health we must have, and health is proportion, so that when a man comes into your room and says he is Christ, a common delusion, and has messages, as they mostly have, and threatens, as they often do, to kill himself, you invoke proportion. Order rest in bed, rest in solitude, silence and rest, rest without friends, rest without books. Without messages, six months rest until a man who went in weighing seven stone six comes out weighing 12. Those were the days of mental bloodletting. Right, yeah. Those were the days of no treatment. And Virginia Woolf clearly had something she wanted to say about that. Absolutely. Oh, exactly. All right, let's turn back to the main part of our novel. I really should say again that throughout this entire novel, we're meeting, as I said, almost a hundred different characters, sometimes for just a quick line or two. What happens is, as some of our main characters are walking down the street or entering a room, leaving a room, all of a sudden we get the interior thoughts of a servant or the interior thoughts of a person that Peter Walsh walks by. We get two lines, three lines, and then they're never heard from again. Sometimes this technique was a little jarring for me. How about you? Well, I got the sense of living in a wonderful family in which hundreds and thousands of things and thoughts are going on as I walk by people. I'm always astonished by the mystery of it. So I was impressed by the profile of the people walking down the street, interacting and bumping up against one another, not knowing anything about each other, but all having wonderful interior lives. You know, there was a strange scene where Peter crosses paths with a pretty girl, and then he starts to follow her, and he goes on and on, and he creates almost this entire affair that he's having with this young girl who doesn't even know he's behind her. Oh, I bet you I don't know anybody who's ever done that. No, and we won't ask Kate for her opinion on that. Uh, Go ahead. One of the structural things that happens with the characters that was interesting to me was the way these characters floated between the two things themes between Septimus and Clarissa, connecting the two stories all day long. I'm thinking specifically of the one little girl who's playing and is the transition between Peter and the park and the wife of Septimus, who she bumps into, and then it shifts from Peter's story to Septimus. And that happens throughout with these characters. Did you guys think that Peter and Clarissa were going to fall into an affair? As I was starting to read about Clarissa and her memories of Peter, and now Peter's back, and as you said before, Peter's wearing his heart on his sleeve, I really felt there was going to be an affair. Of course, there's not an affair in this novel, but I was sure there was going to be one. Was I just an easy mark? Well, I never got the feeling that there would be an affair. I never got the feeling that Dalloway or Whitbread or any of the other characters took Peter seriously, uh, because I don't think Peter was ever able to take himself seriously. Peter was wounded. He was a walking wounded. And he was wounded by love. I never got the sense that he had the power enough, nor Clarissa had the willingness to open herself up to anything other than life with Dalloway. And certainly Richard Dalloway had no fears of Peter Walsh. Oh, no. No, no. Never. But Richard Dalloway also, he couldn't tell Clarissa how he felt. All throughout this novel, we had a lot of, as we've said many times, 
a lot of interior dialogue where these folks were conversing and being very articulate, expressing their emotions and their feelings, and yet none of it comes out of their mouth. Richard Dalloway brought flowers for Clarissa. Peter didn't. Yeah, but Richard Dalloway bought flowers and wanted to tell his wife, I love you. He went home specifically to give her the flowers and say, I love you, and even said to himself, That thing which no one never does say. And does he ever say it? He doesn't. He never says it. He shows it. He shows it. Peter talks it. Not ever to Clarissa, but to himself. All right. Two more quick things about Septimus before we move back to Clarissa and her party. I went to my dictionary to look up the word Septimus. Apparently, it's got the same root as the word septicemia, which, as we know, is a disease of the blood through gangrene, which occurred during world wars when men weren't treated quickly enough. They got septicemia, and then whatever limb it was went gangrene and had to be amputated. Was Septimus, I don't know, did he have a septicemia of the mind? Is that where Virginia Woolf was going, or am I stretching it a little bit too far? Oh, that's a wonderful way of looking at it. There was a great deal of hope, I think, still for Septimus. Even his wife said it was a silly, silly dream, being unhappy, and she felt hopeful. But the system was upon him. Human behavior was upon him, and there was no escape in that room except to jump. You know, that was the other thing I wanted to mention about Septimus. There was one brief moment where we had hope. Yes. Where we thought maybe we've turned a corner. There was a scene with him and his wife. His wife is working on a hat, and they had just had some fun with the hat. And Septimus was laughing, and the wife was hopeful at that moment. She was distrustful of the medical establishment. She knew that there was a part of Septimus which was still alive and functioning. The hat scene was a glorious scene that lasted only a few fleeting moments before the footsteps. Right. Septimus hears the footsteps of the doctor coming, basically to take him away. Mm-hmm. And he jumps out the window and kills himself. I believe Riza goes to intercede and stop the doctor. So she leaves the room. That's right. And he's there alone. He's there alone. And he jumps out the window. Well, on that sorrowful note, let's move back to Clarissa in the evening of her party. Actually, before we talk about the party, I'd be remiss if we didn't talk a little bit about Clarissa and Richard's daughter, Elizabeth, and her tutor. She has a strange tutor, Miss Kilman. Miss Kilman was the history teacher. But more than just a history teacher. Yes, live-in and companion for daughter Elizabeth, who I think is 15 or 16, something like that, on the verge of choosing what she wants out of life. And at that age, of course, all impressionable with religion, and Miss Kilman has enveloped her in the passion of religion. It's actually a new passion for Miss Kilman, too. It is, yeah. She has recently been saved, I guess. This has put a barrier of sorts between Clarissa and her daughter, Elizabeth. She feels Elizabeth is being pulled towards this. She's afraid of it. Passion and religion for Clarissa are the same thing. They take from you what is essentially you— and they're both dangerous. Miss Kilman represents this, and they have this almost outward hatred for each other. I mean, they're very polite to each other, but in a hostile way. Miss Kilman takes Elizabeth shopping, and then she wants to take her to church. Clarissa wants Elizabeth to be there for the party. This is kind of the underlying thing that goes on during the day. Miss Kilman is kind of a strange character, isn't she? She doesn't see herself as a very attractive person. I think she was a counterpart to Peter. She sees herself as a loser in many ways and as a very sad person who is also a very angry person. She goes around dressed in a raincoat. Mm -hmm. A poor, ragged raincoat. That's right. Engaged in discussions with herself in which she guesses about what other people are thinking. And she never guesses that they're thinking well of her. Yeah, she thinks they're thinking ill of her almost all the time. And she gets a lot out of this. This is her identity to be put upon. The phrase that Virginia uses is, all her soul rested with that grievance stuck in it. Which I think Elizabeth recognizes. When she leaves her in the tea room with her brooding, much as Clarissa would leave Peter alone with his brooding. Is that a defining choice for Elizabeth at the moment she leaves the tea room and gets on a double-decker bus? To go to the party? And she turns from the grayness and sadness and the oppression of Miss Kilman and becomes bubbly and happy. She becomes her mother. Exactly. All right, as I promised, let's get back to Clarissa's party. And finally, it's at the party that we meet our last main character in the novel, Sally Seaton, Clarissa's childhood friend. Sally Seaton is one of my favorite people. She, for me anyway, epitomizes the person who sort of had it all. 
She took the risks. She was herself. She married well and had children, and she shows up at the party, and Clarissa has not seen her, apparently, since they were very young. Early on in the book, one of the scenes was Sally running out of the bedroom, down the hall, naked, to get something that she had forgotten in the bathroom. And of course, this is Victorian England, and you didn't do this. And so, this is Sally. And when she comes to the party, she introduces herself as Lady... Lady Rossiter. Rossiter. And she's older, and she has accepted it, and she's gracious, and she's a whole person. And she sort of brings the whole into the book to a place that lets you see that if some of this was just nonsense, this whole life of going back and forth and back and forth, here is proportion. Here is divine proportion without all the nonsense. You know, now that you've mentioned it, I think you're right. I do feel she was probably the most well-rounded, most grounded character in the novel. You know, I'm trying to think now as we're talking, did we have any interior dialogue with Sally or was she just out there? Now that you say it, I don't recall any interior dialogue with her. She is who we see and is what we get. All right, folks, this is the part where I'd like to ask you to tell me something that you liked in the novel or something you hated in the novel. Perhaps a line or two that really sticks with you or maybe even a scene that we've missed. Peter, you want to tell me a little bit about the party? Sure. For those of us who have ever given parties, Clarissa has one of those moments, as I'll read from the book. Oh, dear, it was going to be a failure, a complete failure. Clarissa felt it in her bones as dear old Lord Lexon stood there apologizing for his wife, who had caught cold at the Buckingham Palace garden party. She could see Peter out of the corner of her eye, criticizing her there in that corner. Why, after all, did she do these things? <laughs> well, we have these people gathered in the beginning of the night, and the party has just gotten started, and Peter is in the corner, off brooding, and other people are standing around, not communicating particularly. And Clarissa has this awful thought that it's going to be a dud. But as the party goes on, of course, we have the entrance of Sally Seaton. It never does explain, by the way, to us how Sally ended up there, and Clarissa didn't know she was coming. I guess she just broke into the party. She does mention at one point that she'd heard about the party and came without an invitation, but certainly she had not been invited. Yeah, here's the quote. So, she comes into the room, Lady Rossiter, but who on earth was Lady Rossiter? Clarissa, that voice. It was Sally Seaton? Sally Seaton after all these years? She loomed through the mist, for she hadn't looked like that. Sally Seaton? All on top of each other, embarrassed, laughing, words tumbled out, passing through London, heard from Clara Hayden. What? Chances of seeing you? So I thrust myself in without an invitation. The luster had gone out of her, yet it was extraordinary to see her again. Older, happier, less lovely. They kissed each other, first this cheek and then the other, by the drawing room door. And Clarissa turned in with Sally's hand in hers and saw her rooms full, heard the roar of voices, saw the candlesticks, the blowing curtains, and the roses which Richard had given her. I have five enormous boys, said Sally. She had the simplest egotism, the most open desire to be thought first always. And Clarissa loved her for being so like that. You know, I really did like Sally. And the more I think about the fact that she was the only one that talked to us straight that had no interior dialogue, I guess I like her even more for that. You know, the part I wanted to read is one that we've sort of talked about a little bit. It's this inability of Richard to say I love you to Clarissa. I guess for me, that's what will really stick with me for the entire novel. The inability of these people to tell another person what they're feeling. They have no problem telling themselves what they're feeling. They have no problems having these huge, articulate conversations with themselves, but they just can't get the words out. I understand what you're saying, Peter, about show me, don't tell me, but once in a while, I would like to be told as well as shown. It's just two lines, but let me read them here for you. He was holding out flowers, roses, red and white roses, but he could not bring himself to say he loved her, not in so many words. You know, I find that sad because Clarissa knows he loves her, but I think Clarissa needs to hear it as well as be shown it. But this was Victorian England. Feelings often weren't talked about, especially in marriages. And in reaching out to each other, we have limits. Perhaps that's what we're being told here. 
perhaps Virginia is trying to show us some limits and maybe help us get past some of those? No, just that we have limits in our ability to reach each other and our ability to communicate. We're not perfect communicators. We're limited, faulty human beings who have to be accepted for that, which Peter could never accept. But Virginia Woolf, she did a great job of communicating with us, though, didn't she? I thought she did a wonderful job. I agree. Just wonderful. All right, we're going to bring our conversation about the novel Mrs. Dalloway to a close. Again, I want to thank both of you, Katie and Peter, for coming in and having this conversation about Virginia Woolf's Mrs. Dalloway with me. Thanks so much for having us. We really enjoyed being here. Thank you very much. I also had a wonderful time. Thanks again. You've been listening to Novel Conversations. Novel Conversations is a production of Evergreen Podcasts, formerly the Front Porch People. If you'd like to hear more Novel Conversations, you can go to our new network at evergreenpodcast.com or listen on iTunes, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. And if you like the podcast, don't forget to leave us a review. It really helps. Novel Conversations was produced by Julie Fink and engineered by Sean Rule Hoffman. A special thanks to our executive producer, Joan Andrews, and our researchers, Jeff and Sandra Inskeep Fox. And I'm your host, Frank Lavallo. Until next time, I hope you find yourself in a novel conversation. Are you tired of seeing your teen or young adult struggle on a path that clearly isn't the right fit? Is your teenager confused about which direction to take after high school? The future of work is changing rapidly, and our kids need to know all of the options available after high school so they're empowered to make the choice that is best for them. In each episode, we explore the latest trends that are shaping the opportunities of today and tomorrow. I'm your host, Betsy Jewell, and this is the High School Hamster Wheel Podcast. This podcast was produced with the support of the Ohio Motion Picture Tax Credit and in partnership with the Ohio Development Services Agency.